quickly to, to Twitter? What happened to their security risk at the, at the same time? It did pretty much the opposite. So they had a very, very brief point, two, two, um, maybe too short to even tweet, uh, uh, where those things crossed. That's when they needed to start paying attention to security, or maybe the day before th th that day is when they really needed to start focusing on security. But that is almost impossible to catch. They don't want to invest in security when their market risk is high. The, the most important thing when their market risk is high and nobody knows who they are is to stay in business until tomorrow. Eventually, they become a critical and, and, and maybe tr even trusted source. And then they got to start thinking about if, we're gonna, if people are going to trust us, we've got to invest in security. But they're not going to do that too early. So what that means is we're always going to be coming in saying, you should have called me yesterday. So instead of, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying you shouldn't say, you should, you should have called me yesterday. Go ahead and make, make them feel bad about it. Uh, um, but also get good at it. Get good at taking people who don't understand security, who haven't thought about security from the beginning, and improving th their security. Get good at coming from behind. OK, so that means poorly written code. It means code that was written without security controls. And generally speaking, it means making order from chaos. It, it means that uh, our job as reverse engineers trying to figure out what in the heck were you trying to do with this is, is here to stay. Remember the Terminator? I mean, the original, the original Terminator? If you don't, um, let, me, let me do you, uh, let me give you like a, a, a three sentence summary of the, of the movie plot. So, scary robot, that's Arnie, goes back in time to kill a woman who hasn't done anything yet. That's a scary movie. Like, it, about the only way you could make it scarier is if, if uh, the future governor of California went back in time to, to it, 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 and it's a scary movie all, all by itself. Even at the time, it, it was a scary movie. Uh, um, because there's this unsuspecting woman. She, she, she's done nothing to deserve this robot, kill killer robot from the future, right? So my assertion here is that this is exactly the same thing that happens to us when we ship software. Even if you did think about security and do all, everything right before you ship your code, after you ship your code, you, go, you wake up the next morning and the world knows more about security than they did the day before. Your, your attackers know more about security than you did when you made the code. The world knows more about security than when you made the code. That essentially means you're going to be attacked by bad guys from the future. That's scary stuff. OK, so what do you do if, if you're trying to prepare to defend yourself against somebody who knows more than you do, who's better equipped to find holes in your system than you are? Well, first of all, you better be prepared to monitor that system, because you don't know when or where or how exactly you're going to be attacked. Secondly, you better be prepared to modify that system because you're going to have to compensate for something that, that was not right. You know, it, it, I, I talk about modifying the system and monitoring the system sort of with the assumption that you know where the system is. What I find from talking to a lot of people is they don't necessarily know where the system is. So sort of a prerequisite to all of this is you got to know where your code is. OK, third point. That's Air Force One. So. Uh, um, we, we spend a, a fair amount of money protecting our, our president. Um, costs, I think, costs a couple hundred grand to move Air Force One across the country. And uh, part of that is, uh, is security considerations, certainly. There's, a, there's an advanced team. Um, certainly, you don't want to fly your little private plane anywhere too close to where, where this plane is going. Oh, and by the way, if, if for some reason this, this plane needed to make an unforeseen pit stop, there are some angry Marines sitting in it, and, and you don't want to tangle with them. Um, so what, what's the basic approach that we use to protect uh, uh, Air Force One? Maybe I should jump ahead a little bit and explain my analogy. So think, think about, think about uh, let's call the president the data. Yeah? And the vehicle is the way we're going to get the data uh, around. That's the software. The software controls where the data is going to go. Right? 
You want to you want to protect that you want to protect that data. How could you protect it? Well, you could make everyone with an airplane register so that we know all the other airplanes out there. Or we could make everyone with a weapon register so that if anyone with a weapon got too close to the president, then we'd know about it. Well, those don't seem like they're going to work too well. Instead, one of the things that we do is bake a lot of defense into this airplane. Angry Marines on the airplane, countermeasures that come out of the back of the airplane, a whole heck of a lot more horsepower than you need to fly a big airplane like that. The defense is built in to the system. It's not done solely by trying to control all of the things around the system. We don't just send the, the Air Force to make sure that the weak plane is going to be OK. Instead, the defense travels with the system. OK, so what I take from that is it's a winner to have code that protects itself, especially code that's going to jump around a lot. If you want to put code in the cloud, you're not quite sure how many servers it's going to run on or which service provider it's going to be running on. You want code that protects itself. You don't want to try and defend far away from the code. You don't want to try and make all the bad guys register w with you. Uh, um, it's a loser to try and protect vulnerable code by watching the network, especially if you don't know where the code is going to be. OK, so here's a quick case study to try and, to try and bring this into more concrete terms. Here's a quick case study about a victory that I don't think we celebrate very often. Here's the OWASP Top 10, 2004. Project lead, Jeff Williams, I think. I don't know if he's still the project lead, but he was the project lead then. A5, buffer overflow. You look at OWASP, uh, you look at OWASP uh, Top 10, 2007. You look at OWASP Top 10, 2010. Buffer overflow is not there anymore. There are a lot of familiar friends here that, that did stick around. Cross-site scripting, configuration management. A lot of stuff did s stick around. Moved around a bunch. Every so often, something new vaulted into the top 10. Uh, Cross-site request forgery would be a, be a good example. But not a lot of things just overnight disappear. They usually sort of, you'd expect them to sort of move down a little bit and then maybe disappear. Buffer overflow went from A5 to never heard of you. How'd that happen? Maybe Jeff Williams just didn't know what he was talking about when he, when he put it in there. You think? I don't. I think he did know what he, I think he did. He, he did know what he was talking about. It just turns out that in 2004, it, it wasn't clear that the web wasn't going to be made out of C and C++. It's gonna be, it was going to be made out of Java and .NET and now Ruby and PHP. And all of those languages don't have the buffer overflow problem. In other words, we largely eradicated one of the OWASP top 10 by shifting to better languages. And the way those better languages get rid of buffer overflow is it a combination of compile time checks and runtime checks that make buffer overflow not impossible, but a heck of a lot harder to shoot yourself in the foot with than if you're writing a program in C. So there's an example about where we baked in a security control into all the code that, that gets written and then distributed it. And we actually killed something in the OWASP top 10 with that approach. That's a pretty good deal. OK. So with, with those points as my, as my inspiration and really thinking about buffer overflow as kind of my guiding light, I, uh, I, I did what I think chief scientists do, which is they take a pile of philosophy and they go bug engineers until they build something out of it. So uh, the ch title chief scientist is actually, is actually useful for that. So now I'm going to show you what we built over the last year.